I've come to London to meet Max Wilson, archivist of the Lloyd's Register Foundation, to find out about composite ships and the rules and regulations of shipbuilding. Max, what are the rules and regulations? So the Lloyd's Register rules and regulations are defined standards and frameworks for regimenting the, uh, the construction, maintenance uh, and design of vessels throughout their lives. Why were they needed? Historically, uh, there were very little guides, uh, you know, dating back to the 18th century, that really actually codified particular mo or advised modes of construction. Um, and so these types of rules and regulations were very useful as a guide for, for ship owners and for shipbuilders to be able to inform how they were building their vessels and what safety standards, what particularly defined standards would be, would be most useful for them. But also more than that, as throughout the 19th century, technology started to move on and you have changes in materials um, from, you know, from wood to, to composite or to iron uh, and steel, and obviously you know, changes in modes of, pr of propulsion, shipping became infinitely more dangerous as well. And so there was even more guidance that was sought from classification societies like Lloyd's Register from shipbuilders and ship owners who were looking to try and regiment and, and standardise their practices uh, and minimise risk. There's always a problem with any kind of rules and regulations. Well, there are two problems, actually. The first problem is how do you get people to follow them? So it's all very well just coming up with some rules and regulations, but actually getting people to follow them is difficult. And the other problem is how do you change them if you need to kind of keep abreast of, of development? So two questions there. One, how do they get people to follow their rules? What's quite interesting about the rules and regulations uh, and, and, and these, the ways in which they're formed is that often it's, it's usually from ship owners and shipbuilders. They're usually the ones that are crying out right. for regulation. Classification has always been uh, particularly sought after as a means of not only being able to mark their vessels with a standard of quality, but also obviously to be able to regulate their own means and modes of shipbuilding. So what's generally been found is that ship owners and shipbuilders have approached Lloyd's Register throughout their life. So the very first iron ship enters Lloyd's Register's rules in 1844, and though it's given an A1 status, as long as the, the vessel has been surveyed, uh, and it's been found to, made of, to be made of good materials, then it's eligible for an A1 status. But obviously that's, that's really it, so it's very brief. And of course it's another 11 years or so before the rules, and, the rules for the construction of iron ships are brought out in 1855. And again, this is something that's seen uh, as being, again, not, not really prescriptive enough. It doesn't particularly favour one mode of construction over another. It doesn't really give an awful lot of guidance on, on materials. It's still largely being calculated on the basis and the understanding of timber vessels. And so even though there are various relaxations in the rules that come after that, um, you know, and by the time you get to 1862, you have a major break within uh, within shipping, and that comes with the formation of the Liverpool Underwriters Register for Iron Vessels, or the Iron Register, which was formed in 1862 by the Liverpool Underwriters to, to try and regulate iron shipbuilding in what they felt was an overly cautious approach by Lloyd's Register. Mm. Composite ships particularly are interesting this period when there's a, a mixture of iron and timber. Tell us about that. Composite ships are slightly unique. Their frames are made of iron uh, and they're usually wooden planked all over. In addition to the frame, the standing rigging, the masts are also iron as well. Mm. So the sort of the age of sail reached its zenith between 1850 and 1870 with the era of the clipper ship and the composite clipper, uh, which were probably the most famous examples of the composite ships that have been built. But this unique structure meant that obviously they had the strength of iron with the frame, but they had some flexibility uh, when it came to the sort of the wooden planking. And so they were very agile and they could be driven at unprecedented speeds. Part of the issue was that with Lloyd's Register surveyors, they were seeing increasing numbers of composite ships that were being put to them, but almost all of them had wildly different designs. Not only did you have shipbuilders then starting to advocate for the need for composite ship rules, but you also have the surveyors themselves yeah. crying out for regulation. And one of those was Harry Cornish, the famous Harry Cornish with his wonderful illustrations. Um, tell us about Harry. Harry John Cornish, he was born in Devonport in 1839, uh, and he later would go on to start his career as a naval architect with Charles Langley's 
Deptford Green shipyard, where actually, interestingly, one of his very early jobs was uh, working with John Scott Russell uh, with the construction of some of the fittings for the Great Eastern. Oh, right, yeah. He joins Lloyd's Register in 1863 as a ship surveyor. His entry to Lloyd's Register coincides with the decision by our committee of surveyors, or a subcommittee of surveyors in 1863, to take on this challenge of composite shipbuilding. So he arrives at a really interesting time in Lloyd's Register's history. They would agree to start putting these rules together in 1863, and they wouldn't be published finally until about 1868. Um, but Lloyd's Register, one of the things they started to do was to advertise, to sort of advertise a competition amongst all of the surveyors who were all um, skilled draftsmen and, 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 and artists in their own right, to be able to, to design these illustrations for the composite ship rules. It went out to a competition and right. Harry John Cornish won this competition yeah. and so his really amazing, astounding designs They're extraordinary. feature, yeah. feature you know, centrally within the composite ship rules. And they were exhibited in Moscow and in Paris at an international exhibition where in Moscow it won a gold, a gold medal, and then in, uh, in Paris it won a bronze medal. So yeah. they were they're amazing, amazing pieces. Yeah. So it's a very clever technique, I think. Mm. And you know, what's also particularly interesting is that you know, Harry John Cornish, he's well known within Lloyd's Register for, for having created and illustrated the rules for composite ships. That, those composite ships also see his own design creep in for the Lady Badge, the, the, literally the logo for Lloyd's Register as well, yeah. know, within those rules. And his designs ended up uh, being seen across several different publications. You know, uh, subsequent rules and regulations, but he also did other publications and social pamphlets and leaflets and things like the Cricket Club minutes and everything else. He illustrated all of those. Um, so he, yeah, he was a very, very keen draftsman and uh, it's noted in one particular record that frequently when he was out on surveys, he would take a notebook with him. And if there were any points where he had to wait around, where he was waiting to meet somebody, he would just sketch. Yeah, that's lovely. Um, it was really nice working with those original drawings and creating an animation out of them, showing how composite ships were put together. It felt like a real nod to an artist from the past, so that's something I'm particularly proud of. Um, now, here at the uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation archives, you have some wonderful material relating to composite ships. Tell us about what you've got here. So, we're very lucky that um, you know, some, of the, some of the members of staff at that time were obviously very keen naval architects at the time, and so... Um, Bernard Weymouth, who joined as a ship surveyor uh, in 1853 and would later go on to be a secretary of Lloyd's Register, was responsible for designing both uh, the Thermopylae uh, in 1868 and the Leander in 1867. So the Thermopylae in particular is a, is a really good example of a composite clipper ship. Um, you know, she was designed by Bernard Weymouth and she would go on to set the world's fastest record uh, at the time between, for the passage between London and Melbourne in just 60 days. Wow. Um, so these composite clipper ships were, you know, were incredibly exciting. They were quite revolutionary and they could, be, they could be driven at these really unprecedented speeds. And it's obviously worth noting that obviously this time you have the establishment of the, the great tea races, yeah. um, you know, where they would become so famous. Um, you know, so they were very highly, highly popularised in the media at this time. So with obviously both the, uh, you know, the Leander and the Thermopylae, we have um, their survey reports and we have their, their ship plans. Um, the other famous vessel that we have is the Cutty Sark, um, which was built in, uh, in 1869 uh, in Dumbarton. Obviously it was the very, you know, one of the very early composite ship clippers to, be, to have been built by the rules for, for composite ships. By the time the rules were published, Ironically, composite ships were had sort of had their heyday. Really, they were already on the way out. Yeah. Uh, and many of these composite clipper ships would end up being switched from the tea trade to the Australian wool trade, where it was believed that steamships were remained uneconomical for such long di um, you know, distances. But we've always had a particularly long relationship with Cutty Sark. Not only did we survey her during her construction and design, despite the the technology having moved on. Um, she was later sold out of the UK, uh, she went into uh, to Portugal, uh, yeah. and when she eventually would come back into UK ownership in 1921, there were very few people who were experienced enough to survey composite clippers. Ah. So the photostat copy that we have of her midship section is from a London surveyor who originally came to Lloyd's Register having worked for the Liverpool Underwriters Registry for Iron Vessels, which we eventually amalgamated with. And he was brought out of uh, retirement in his 90s <laughs> to come back and survey the, the Cutty Sark yeah, to oh. those original rules and regulations because quite understandably the things had moved on so considerably at that point and there were very few people who were qualified to be able to do that kind of survey. That's fascinating.
Really, really intriguing. And then how did the rules and regulations change over time? So the experience of developing the iron ship rules and then later the composite ship rules would have a, a greater effect on how the rules and regulations were put together later. When the iron ship rules were put together, they were being formulated uh, on the basis of the understanding of timber ship. So Bernard Weymouth came up with this system and made the point that uh, with timber vessels, the calculations for constructing their scantlings had been uh, formulated based on what, what was a proposed tonnage. Uh, which would usually be usually been specified by, by contract. And what he decided really was that because iron was such a different material to work with, actually it made much more sense to base those calculations on the length of the proposed vessel in proportion to its proposed breadth as well, which would then allow for a greater distribution of material throughout those vessels, making them lighter, more economical, more affordable. Yeah. Um, this amendment to the original iron ship rules would occur in, in uh, 1870 and it would then have a, a knock-on effect with, with other subsequent changes to the rules and regulations, notably the, the 1888 rules for the construction of steel ships. And how strict were these rules? So the rules uh, initially were, were I, I would suspect, fairly fluid, really. Um, generally speaking, the engines, the machinery, um, in the very early days needed to be, be to be surveyed and classified and there needed to be a, a, a relevant certificate that could be provided. And there was very little instruction about modes of shipbuilding in the very early days with timber vessels. By the time we get to the era of the sort of steel vessels, the regimented way in which the rules are being put together was actually not particularly helpful for the shipping industry. That they were taking far too long to put these rules together and you know, they weren't allowing great enough deviation from the rules and innovation. It's worth pointing out that when the rules for steel ships came into play in 1888, they would, at, you know, 90% of the ships that Lloyd's Register was surveying were made and constructed from mild steel. So what's particularly interesting with all of this is there would be subsequent additions to those rules as they went forward. And by the time we get to the 20th century, those like our then secretary would then make the point that the rules and regulations shouldn't be fixed, they shouldn't be unchangeable, but they actually needed to rely on continual data that would have been received and informed and amended. I mean, once again, to go back to the example of uh, steel shipbuilding, yes, the rules were created in 1888. By the time that we get to uh, Harry John Cornish surveying incredibly large, large vessels like the Mauritania and the Aquitania, which were, were record-breaking vessels, these vessels were steel built, but they were existing outside of the proportions that had been set in the 1888. So what you tended to find then was that Lloyd's Register would then, you know, would then amend its rules, and so it amended them in 1909 uh, in the face of that particular, particular issue. Um, and later on, again, as ships got even larger and larger, those steel rules would be uh, amended in 1921 and then again in 1947. So it's, it's a particularly big um, feature, really, of the rules. Lloyd's Register had initially moved from that 30-year gap to wait for you know, 30 years' worth of evidence down to a 10-year gap. Yeah. But what was particularly interesting in 1914 when they put these rules together for, for diesel engines um, was that they preempted um, this particular technological innovation. There were only 47 ships that they'd seen which were either in the yards or on the sea. Uh, and so they put these out almost as soon as they'd started to appear to try and preempt that. Mm -hmm. So what Lloyd's Register started to become was more of a reactive organisation to these changes. One of the questions that always strikes me when you're dealing with rules and regulations is that there are probably unwritten rules and regulations which exist alongside the actual written ones. Do you get any sense of that in the kind of the practice of shipbuilding, that yes, you had these written down rules, but there was also a kind of a, uh, stuff that existed between the lines? The human element was always something that was that was, uh, you know, it was almost an unwritten uh, area, really. It was always something that um, was seen to be a particularly large uh, part of any disaster, really. Obviously, you know, you can blame a ship's construction or its maintenance, but obviously it's that human element so often that exacerbates those risks and those disasters. Even though they're not in the rules and regulations, the Register of Ships includes, from 1764, uh, onwards lists of the the masters and the captains that are that are that are in charge of each of these vessels um, and that's a feature of the register of ships all the way up until 1921 for steamers and then for 1947 uh, for for sailing vessels so it does show really that you know, that the reputation of masters and their ability to navigate is, is paramount. And it's not just a question of unwritten rules and regulations, but of interpretation. That's another human aspect. Do you ever get a sense of some surveyors interpreting the rules one way and other surveyors interpreting it in a different way? 
Absolutely. Um, yeah, you, all you have to do is go into the ship plan server report collection, which is online, and what you can usually find is that uh, you have arguments between surveyors and the uh. committees uh, and surveyors and other surveyors who are all sort of calling on each other for how a particular rule could be interpreted you know uh, that's particularly evident even with some of the earlier uh, correspondence about different types of timber that are used uh, in 1837 you get one early addition to the rules which is the um, the specification of things like timber uh, and what kind of scantling uh, dimensions were required um, for use with those timbers. Uh, but again, there's, there's, there's hundreds of different types of wood, uh, you know, and of course you have one particular surveyor in Canada saying that, you know, he has a shipbuilder who's using this particular piece of timber, but there's no guidance for it. Is there any way of making it equivalent to this that is listed? And right. looking at the correspondence, you have the letters, you usually have sort of little scribbles around the side where the committee have made a note for it to be filed and then sent back and something formal written. Um, and, you know, if the surveyor is particularly, uh, is particularly bothered by the way that the committee have interpreted the rules, what they will do is they'll sometimes call in another surveyor to then, again, you know, give their opinion on the matter. But obviously the committee's decision is always final, but again, as you can see with the rules and regulations, um, that emphasis on flexibility and not trying to to, to hamper progress and innovation is really key to the decision making and the formulation of those regulations. And so how do these written rules and regulations relate to other content that you have in the archive here? They provide the rationale for how they were operating. Um, so crucially the surveyors that were operating all around the world, these are the rules and regulations that they were using which were governing their activities and their operations wherever they were based. Um, so when we're looking at survey reports or at correspondence, um, you'll sometimes see references to specific rules and specific lines within the rules. Um, and so if nothing else, what it does do is it, it provides a greater context to how they were working, what basis they were operating on, and why, why they were making the decisions that they were making. So, you know, as far as the technological um, innovations that, that we see within the Ship Plan Server Report Collection, you can chart all of those changes, you know, quite radically. And obviously the rules and regulations have changed so much. So. Obviously, you can look at timber vessels in the 1830s and 40s, and then you can look at things like iron ship, the advent, you know, the advent of iron shipbuilding, um, the, the move into composite ships, and then into steel. Um, obviously, most of these uh, today are governed by you know, a great deal of these rules and regulations are governed by uh, the now the International Maritime Organization from uh, 1958 onwards. Um, you know, so areas like structural fire protection, life-saving appliances, uh, stability—they're all governed by international treaties, but there's still a huge amount um, you know, which, which, which comes from the Lloyd's Register rules and regulations. So being able to go back and look at those uh, alongside survey reports and certificates, and it just provides a great deal of context to, to why they are the way that they are. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating aspect of maritime history. I look forward to finding out some more. Thanks, Max. Thank you.